Hey Rebel EM followers, Salim Rezai here, and we're going to talk about this paper that just came out at the end of 2023 called the NICO trial, looking at non-invasive ventilation management of comatose poisoned emergency patients. So tell me if you've heard this scenario, patient gets brought in by EMS, they are intoxicated, they have a GCS of less than eight or nine, they're at risk of vomiting and potentially aspirating. Traditional practice has been to intubate these patients, but what's really unclear is if the risks of the intubation itself outweigh the benefits of doing that. And there have been several observational studies that have looked at this and have had very mixed results, mixed methodology. And so we haven't really had a good trial to kind of help elucidate what we should be doing. And this paper just got published in JAMA in November of 2023 called the NICO trial, Effective Non-Invasive Airway Management of Comatose Patients with Acute Poisoning. And the beautiful thing is it's a randomized clinical trial. So we now have a higher level of evidence than what's been published in the past. I have the PubMed ID link for you here at the bottom if you want to pull the paper yourself. The clinical question these authors were trying to answer is, in patients with suspected acute poisoning and a GCS of less than 9, is a conservative airway strategy of withholding intubation associated with a reduction in death, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, compared to routine practice of intubation. So what they did was a multi-center randomized clinical trial. It was performed in 20 emergency departments and one ICU in France. And patients included were comatose patients with acute poisoning and a GCS of less than nine. Why they chose nine instead of eight, I don't know, because the old adage of GCS less than eight, you intubate. And I think we've reviewed a few papers now on RebelEM about why that adage is not necessarily correct. So the standard group was you intubate. And so patient having seizures, respiratory distress, vomiting, and shock, the patient gets intubated. The conservative strategy was no intubation. Um, unless the patient was having one of these terrible things like seizing, respiratory distress, vomiting, or shock, but it was really left to the discretion of the physician on whether these patients got intubated or not. Now, if intubation was required, regardless of which arm you were in, the induction agents used were atomidate or ketamine, the paralytic agents used were succinylcholine or rocuronium, Patients were all pre-oxygenated to get an oxygen saturation of 100% times 2 minutes, and if you couldn't achieve that, then non-invasive ventilation was allowed. Laryngoscopy was kind of the wild, wild west. It could be video or direct laryngoscopy. It could be bougie first or endotracheal tube with a stylet. And the way they confirmed their endotracheal tube uh, placement was with waveform capnography, which we should all be doing uh, in our practice. Now, the exclusion criteria are super important here. So if there was an immediate need for intubation, and I've already gone over some of those, patients were having respiratory distress, they were having a suspected traumatic brain injury, they were having seizure, or they were having shock, those patients were automatically excluded. Now, if you took a cardiotropic drug, such as a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker, or an ACE inhibitor, you were also excluded. And then if you took a substance that could be immediately reversed, like opioids or benzodiazepines, you were also excluded. So this doesn't leave a lot of things that people can overdose on. I suspect you can overdose on anything. But what you'll see is that the majority of these patients were going to be alcohol intoxication. So 225 patients, the median GCS was about a six. The standard group was intubation. The intervention group was conservative, which was no intubation. And basically, there was 109 patients in the standard arm. There was 116 patients in the intervention arm. And if we look at the number that got intubated, it was interesting that even in the standard arm, standard practice would be to intubate, only 58% required intubation or got intubated in that arm but it was significantly less than the conservative arm of 16%. So there was definitely separation between the groups and they did achieve that in what they were trying to randomize people to. And I already said alcohol was in two thirds of the cases, the thing that was the most abused or the patients were intoxicated with. Now they had a primary outcome that was this hierarchical composite outcome where they basically ranked these things, but really they were looking at 
these each of these components. And so whether you got randomized to being intubated or not being intubated, there was no deaths. So nobody died, which is always a good thing. No surprise, patients who were more likely to be intubated or were intubated were more likely to be admitted to the ICU, 66.1% versus 39.7%. The ICU length of stay, once you got there, was 24 hours if you were intubated. It was zero hours if you weren't. And then the hospital length of stay was also a little bit longer, 37 hours versus 21.5 hours. Now, adverse events. This is what we really care about and what we are always like arguing about whether we should intubate or not intubate these people. So pneumonia was actually more common in the group that got intubated than the group that was managed conservatively. And we will look at adverse events, things like hypoxemia, failed first pass success of intubation, uh, hemodynamic untoward effects from just the intubation itself was also higher in the standard group compared to the conservative group. Now, by not intubating people, another way of saying this in numbers that make sense, the risk of pneumonia was reduced with an absolute risk reduction of 7.8%, which would be a number needed to treat of 13 by not intubating patients. First pass intubation failure rate was reduced by 12.2% absolute risk reduction with a number needed to treat of eight. Now, another thing that's worth mentioning here is none of these patients, regardless of which arm they went into, got gastric evacuation, lavage, or activated charcoal. So the bottom line of the NICO trial is in patients with decreased level of consciousness due to acute poisoning, minus the exclusions we talked about, right? Because you can't generalize this to all of them. A conservative strategy of withholding intubation leads to less ICU admits, length of ICU and hospital stay being shorter, and a lower risk of adverse events. And so I think we now have good evidence that supports trying to manage these patients conservatively outside the settings of the things we talked about, patient in shock, respiratory distress, seizing, suspected traumatic brain injury. Outside those things, we just need to let these people metabolize to freedom and not use up resources. And it also turns out less adverse events. Let me know your thoughts, comments, and questions. I'm interested to see how people manage these patients because we all do this a little bit differently. As always, thank you for tuning in and until next time.